God helps those who help themselves is not in the Bible. I think Ben Franklin or somebody said it, but, but it, it did seem to be uh, the thought that was directing the actions of James and John as they employed their mom to secure top spots with Jesus. Now, this power grab, so blatant as, as it was, it doesn't really shock us or surprise us because well, that's just how life is in the real world. Well, we see it every day in the classroom as two kids are struggling with each other. Who gets to sit with the teacher, you know, here at open arms? And, or, or in politics. It, that's all politics is, is jockeying for position of who's in control. It, it, it's just here, though. As we see what's going on, we, we really are uncomfortable because we kind of hope that at this highest level of our examples of James and John that it would be different. You know, that they're supposed to get it right even though the rest of us get it wrong. And if this is what following Jesus and doing good looks like, the bar is set awfully low and it saddens us. Well, uh, sickens us when we see failure in our church leadership. And if they aren't able or even willing to do good, what, what hope do the rest of us who are following their example really have? And, and if you're looking for some kind of excuse to discredit or uh, dismiss Christianity, I mean, right here is yet another glowing example of hypocrisy. So you would expect that Jesus would come down on them hard, saying something with a strong rebuke like, have you guys been listening to me at all in the last two years? You seem to be more concerned about power and your personal glory and who's the boss rather than serving other people and, and loving God with everything that you are. And you used your mom? Ugh. Well, Jesus didn't say anything like this. There was no rebuke or reprimand, no moral evaluation of the request at all. Instead, Jesus gave a very strange response. Well, are you able to drink the cup? Huh? Did you think about that? Oh, we are. Well, okay, but you know, guys, just to be honest with you, I, I can't give it to you because my right and left-hand spots are already chosen by the Father. So my hands are tied. Now, before we immediately jump into the more juicy, gossipy parts, like well, what the other ten say, you know, when they found out they tried to get the jump on them, rather than going there, we really need to understand thoroughly the questions of James and John and this very cryptic response of Jesus, of, of cup, and it's been determined. Because in this very weird conversation, we see two extremely common ways of living life in which everyone, you and I, are taking one path or the other that's right there in front of us. And the paths that are mentioned here are you're either living your life like James and John and just grab the gusto, make it happen, it's up to you, or no, life is all predetermined by God. The script is written, it's all set, and you just are on that tr railroad track. Or it's up to you. One of these two ways of life you and I are living. And, and the best example for divine um, predetermined fate is seen in the Greek tragedy Oedipus. Now, if you remember back in your school days of this quite awful story, that the divine oracles had declared of the baby Oedipus that he would one day grow up and kill his father and marry his mother. Ew. But that was a curse, okay? It was, it was like, your, your land is cursed and this is part of it. And of course, after all the heroic efforts to make sure this baby didn't grow up and, and have all these things happen, and even, even Oedipus is, you know, struggling and the story picks up where, you know, Oedipus is already king, and there's a famine in the land, and they're trying to figure out why. Well, it's because somebody killed his father, and let's find out who, and oh, it was, it was Oedipus. And 
And then as steps get closer to realize exactly who your wife is, Oedipus, his wife kills herself and he gouges out his eyes once he figures out he's married his mom. Oh, and, and then he exiles himself. But the poor guy didn't have a choice, right? It was all divine, predetermined fate and destiny. Oh. Or you're living the other way, the other path of life, which is best seen in the 1980s movie, Back to the Future. At the end of this trilogy, Marty McFly is informed that the future, Marty, is what you make of it. So go out there and make it a good one. It's like, okay. So knowingly or unknowingly, your life is being formed and designed, your decisions all by one of these two paths. You're either the kind of person who could just boldly go up to Jesus and say, hey, I want to sit there. And you'd make it happen. Or you're the kind of person that says, oh, just what is is. You know, we're going to drift along. Those spots have been cho chosen. Life's okay. I'm okay. We're okay. You're one of those others. Now, today, most people are more like James and John because, you know, you, you work hard. You get a payoff. And, and there's a real promise and, and good evidence that supports that. And so it's very motivating. You live by that grab the gusto. God is helping those who help themselves. And, and you teach your children to do the same. You know, work hard in school. Strive for the top spot. Anybody can be president. You know, all that kind of talk we give to one another. And, and it really does pay off so that if you're not happy with your life right now, you're not happy with your job, your marriage, your church, your community, whatever it is, then, then do something about it. Get up and go. Strive for it. Get to that left-hand spot, that right-hand spot. And if you don't, you have no one to blame but yourself. So the thinking in that way of life would say. But what we don't talk about is the collateral damage from that way of life. Yeah, anybody can become president, right? No. I mean, anybody can be a professional baseball player if you work hard enough. No. All right. It's just not going to happen but very few people. And so the collateral damage is the pain and sorrow of working as hard as you can and still not measuring up. With all of this, James and John, Jesus knows exactly what all that leads to. There was no correction, no rebuff, but there was more to the story. Because Jesus told them, I can't, I can't give it to you. It's all been predetermined by my Father. Now, in the upside-down kingdom of Jesus in which we live, this is a mind-bender, but absolutely everything has been predetermined and your personal choices are 100% in play. Now, I know that you don't have a mental category in your brain to make sense of that. How could something be predetermined and you have a say in it? It's either one or the other. And yet, let's look at the upside-down kingdom. Let's look at the days of your life and that every one of your days has been preordained. It's been set. You're going to live a set number of days because God has determined it. And yet, if you're smoking all of your life, your days are fewer, right? If you drive drunk on Kellogg, your days are fewer. And yet, every one of your days has been preordained. And yet, your choices make a difference. Don't break your brain. Let's keep going. Now, you are in the kingdom, the upside-down kingdom of Jesus. And you're thinking, well, one day I just made a decision for Jesus, or, or, or I was this or that, or I just felt it in my heart. Well, the reason that you are in the kingdom it's because of destiny. You have been predestined by God and that you are, oops, I went too far. Uh, Jesus, uh, you are also chosen having been predestined according to the plan who works out everything in conformity with his will. Now, don't go there. Well, well if I've been predestined to be part of the kingdom, has God predestined some to go to hell? The Bible doesn't say that. We could spend a whole lot more time talking about that. Not going to do it. But at least what you know is that you have been predestined. It's God's choice. Even Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And, and God is now working all things in your life. God is for your eternal good. And then the good that you do, God has worked everything 
uh, you're his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God created, prepared in advance for you to do. It's all predetermined. And yet, you are not Oedipus on this crash course with your divine destiny and fate because you can say, no, Oedipus couldn't. So, how does this work? How can everything be God's choice and everything be your choice? The only way it works is if you are in an intimate relationship with the one who predetermines everything. It only works when you are in intimate relationship with God himself, and that's something that Oedipus did not have. But you have to keep in mind that every one of your prayers is not bouncing off this predetermined answer wall and bouncing back to you, but your requests get a hearing with God, just like James and John. And it is your dear Heavenly Father, who may at times say, no, I've chosen someone else. But it is your dear Father who says this to you, His dear children. It is the same Father who says, ask of me and I will give it. Knock on my door, I open it to you. Seek me, you will find me. This is the God who's predetermined all things to work for your eternal good. And that good thing may very well be the answer, no or not now, or I've chosen others, or you can work as hard as you want in your life and you still will not obtain your goal. But when you are in an intimate relationship with God, sometimes there's even a change in His mind. I know. Think of this. I can just come up with three immediate answers, and the first one is Abraham as he bargains with God about the divine fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, I'm going to destroy them. And Abraham's like, well, what if there's 50 people there who are righteous? Or 40 or 30, 10. And God said, okay, I won't do it if we find 10. Now, they only found four and only three of them made it out. Lot's wife didn't make it. So, okay, maybe not the best example, but let's look at Moses. Moses has given the people the Ten Commandments, and they're all shouting together, we will do it, we will be God's people. And Moses is like, this is great. He goes back up the mountain. He's 40 days with God, getting the plans for this, this tent of meeting, which God will live right in the center of all of his people and be their God. And, and as he comes down the mountain with these plans, the people are, are worshiping the golden calf. And God said to Moses, Get away from me, Moses. Let my anger burn and I will destroy every last one of them. And I will make you into the great nation. And Moses pleaded with him, no, don't do it. Remember your promise to, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Don't do it. And God, check the text, repented, changed his mind. King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. The prophet comes to him. Says, God has given me the word, you're going to die. Hezekiah throws himself on the ground. He prays to God, No, please, God, give me more time. And as the prophet's leaving the palace, God tells him to turn back around, come back, tell the king, 15 more years of life. Huh, thank you. When you're in an intimate relationship with the one who predetermines everything, your prayers matter. What you do matters. Your requests matter because you matter to him. And so as you think about all of this and you're trying to make sense of it in your mind, it, it really kind of sounds like, well, maybe, maybe God does help those who help themselves. I mean, without those requests, without those prayers of Moses, Abraham, and Zechariah, it wouldn't have happened. But the Bible doesn't say it, and there's a reason. And the reason is the cup. Remember Jesus told the two brothers, James and John, are you able to drink this cup? And, and they said they could, but Jesus knew they had no idea what it meant. But Jesus knew that it had been predestined, preordained by God, prepared that he would carry their griefs and their sorrows. It would mean that our afflictions would be on him, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, that the iniquity of us all would be laid upon him. And while they had no clue that this would mean the suffering and death of Jesus or what kind of person it takes 
to accept such a fate from God. So Jesus showed them, I, I have come to serve, not to be served, and to give my life as a ransom for all. You see, Jesus has complete and utter freedom to do whatever He wants. And what He wants to do is be completely obedient to the destiny of His Father. And He drinks that cup to its dregs. And there at the cross, He dies. But then, the oracle is now broken that stood against us, that said, the soul that sins shall die. Our unchanging fate has now been changed by Jesus because He has asked the Father on our behalf that we would have life and freedom and forgiveness. And the Father has listened to His Son and on, on the, for, the, for the sake of Jesus, we now have life. As He rises from the dead, he, he now reigns at the right hand. He's the one at the right hand of the Father. He's the one who has a kingdom of people in this upside-down kingdom in which we too have a cup. But our cup isn't like His. It, we're not going to be crucified or, or pay for our sins. Our cup is a death and a dying to ourselves where we would use our freedoms treasures, our talents, everything about us simply to make a better future for ourselves. Dying to that selfishness of James and John to serve like Jesus, our neighbor. See, our, our cup is that we are being transformed by Jesus from the inside out to be the kind of people who would, in fact, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility, counting others more significant than ourselves, looking not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. You'll know that you've gone deeper and deeper into this upside-down kingdom and that, that this Jesus life is going deeper into your soul when you see within yourself there's less and less I'm living my life for me and what I can get out of this life and all of your resources and your time and your efforts are being for other people. And it's not simply because you're doing it to get out of some divine fate. It's, it's who you are becoming in Jesus. And, and that becoming is when this good news goes deeper and deeper, when you realize that you are no longer under the threat of punishment for your sin. You're no longer being paid to be good. You're simply children of the divine God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And out of His grace, He has made you His own. The more that guides and directs your life, the more and more Jesus is using your life to serve other people. And so to Him be all glory and honor and praise. Amen. We stand then to confess our faith to one another, saying that I believe